I asked everybody uh, who was going to be telling a story tonight to sort of send me like a couple of lines. And uh, of course, our next speaker is uh, Chidi Onguka. And uh, I'm glad that I put it down here. It says, Hi, Jonathan. My story is a collection of sweet little anecdotes illustrating the absurdity of intolerance. Smiley face. <laughs> As for the introduction, something along the lines of someone who's dedicated their life to watching the world go by. Ladies and gentlemen, Chidi! Hi. And you know, if you were born in Lagos, Nigeria, right, then your normal would be the hustle and buzz, the song, and the energy of 21 million people crisscrossing the city. And if you're born in Amsterdam, you're normal with canals, bicycles, rickety houses, uh, tourists who may ask why you're not wearing clogs. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, it was normal for me to um, walk through the centre of Oxford and be greeted with a monkey chant. And if, if we, on, on good occasions, you'd actually get a performance. And the performance was that like, the, the knees would bend something like this, and the arms would come out and bounce up and down, and you'd hear a loud and clear, ooh, ooh, ah, ah. And for me as a kid, this was very weird. It was really weird, because I knew it was directed towards me, or us, if I was with other members of my family, but it just made no sense. I was like, why would, why would somebody do that? So anyway, you, you know how you, you learn about the world by um, watching your parents' reactions to things? So if I was with my dad and somebody threw an ooh, ah, ah at us, then it was as if nothing happened. You wouldn't even blink. You'd just, just keep walking. And when I asked him, why did people do that? He said, because they were confused. <laughs> but my mother, on the other hand, she, she's, a very, she's a very lively woman, very sensitive. And the monkey chant made her twitch or flinch, like when she pricked her finger with a, a sewing needle. And her eyes would narrow, and she'd get really angry. She'd be furious, but she wouldn't say anything. And if I asked her, why did people do this? She said, because they were crazy. And because I was young, I figured out it made a lot of sense how confusion could lead to craziness. Because, <laughs> for example, I had my Lego, and I arranged it according to size and color. And if my sisters came here, it would just be a complete mess. And I couldn't find anything, and I'd get incredibly angry. So I understood how... You could be confused and you get crazy, but I didn't quite understand how crazy turned people, uh, made people behave like monkeys in the street. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the general rule in my house is when people did that, you should ignore them, you just, you just walk. But I couldn't ignore them, I had to see who was doing it. And so sometimes it'd be one person, sometimes it'd be two people, sometimes it'd be like, the kid and his sister and then his mom would be smiling the dad would be rubbing his head and it was like oh, okay okay all right but they're not real monkeys but they're pretending to be monkeys and there was one time this guy walking down st albany's and when i was a kid men had this thing they did with long umbrellas they could walk and as they walked they kind of swung this umbrella back and forth and they had this wonderful timing and i i find it so amazing and some people were really good at it, and some people weren't so good at it. And this guy was just amazing. I was watching him, he's walking, and he's just like a gentleman. He had this sort of leather thingy with a zip where you put eight, four pads under here, and his right arm um, has this uh, umbrella swinging. And then he sees me watching him, and without breaking stride, he just looks at me and goes, I'm a kid, I'm just looking like it. <laughs> was normal, that was normal, you know? But sometimes it went beyond just the monkey charm. So once I'm walking along the Thames with my mom, and the river is on the left, and we're really all the way over on the right, because there's this kid called Douglas in my school, and he said that swans peck your eyes out. So I was really scared of swans, so I'd always <laughs> stay far away from the water. And then with my mum in between, just in case, so I was really scared. <laughs> lady there with her son, son, maybe nine or ten, he was much bigger than I was at the time. And as they approached, she did this thing that we often got, where she just flicked her head to one side and walked by, as if we weren't there. And then her son, her son, he made this face and stuck out his tongue like his tongue's a dagger. 
And just as they passed us, my mum just went like that, and she let go of my hand and spun around. So I spun around to see why she spun around, and I saw her bless this kid with an African slap. Now, <laughs> I'm a Nigerian, I live here, and I spend a lot of time, time trying to explain that Africa is in a village where half the people are called Mufulu and the other half Mufamfa. No. <laughs> but there are some things which are generic to Africa below the Sahara, and one is the African slab. The African slab begins about 6.7 to 7.3 kilometers behind the slapper. <laughs> it's created by a sense of righteous indignation, and it sweeps across the ground, gathering speed, dust clouds in its way, faster and faster, then POW! In that instant, you will understand the forces that created the Big Bang. In that moment, in that moment, in that moment you will see the spiritual history of humanity <laughs> before you fall to the ground and start crying like a baby. Now this kid, he didn't fall to the ground, he backflipped. <laughs> it's like, I'm there? What? My mum did it, he backflipped. He landed on his feet and started so squealing like a piglet. And then his mother started shouting at my mother, and in all the confusion, it sounded like a tick. I <laughs> I just heard the noise. And then after a time, I could understand the turkey talk and what she was saying. She said, why did you hit him? He only wanted to find out if you had a tail. And they got into this argument. And while they're arguing, the only thing I'm thinking is my mother slapped this kid into an automatic background. <laughs> so she's like this super duper ninja comfort. <laughs> When I did, there was a shop called Boswell's, and Boswell's was like the magic kingdom. Boswell's was a toy shop, and it had every kind of toy you could imagine. It had toys you couldn't imagine that anyone would make into a toy until you saw them with your eyes. You'd see, say, what? That's a toy? And it was a toy. And um, there was one big window on the left, and I never seemed to look into the window on the left, but there was this window on the right, and every week, somebody in Boswell's would create this whole world made, of, made up of different toys. Just really fascinating, absolutely amazing. And every kid would stop there when they could. And I did the same. So on this day, I stopped there. And there were two things that caught my attention. One thing was after there was this monkey in a, a spacesuit. And um, uh, the year before, this is the I'm talking about, the year before they'd gone to the moon. So there was a lot of stuff about space. And people who know me know that I'm a, one of the hardest core fans of monkeys, probably in the top 10 in the world. I really love monkeys. But, I was eight, and that meant I was beyond cuddly toys. So the monkey was cool, but it wasn't for me. But what was really amazing in this window was this Meccano set. It was this Meccano set, and they built this um, like ski lift that just went up. It went down again, went up, went down, went up, and I was looking at this thing. I was watching it, I was wondering, how did the lift know when to go up, when to go down? And I also realized that my own Meccano set at home needed a serious upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> And of course I'm not alone, it's Boswell, so there are the kids there with their mums and dads. And I'm staring at this thing, and then somebody just pokes me on the sh shoulder and he says, Hey, Nignock, is that your brother wearing a spacesuit? And my whole mood, it just deflated, because I knew exactly who it was, I didn't need to look. There was this guy called Stephen, and he was in the class above. And he just bugged me all the time. Every time he saw me, he would just come, he'd say, Jungle Bunny, Rubber Lips, chocolate man, he, he just had things, he kept saying them. And I'd always ignore him because my friends had said, you're meant to ignore this kind of stuff, you're meant to leave it alone. And so I'd leave it alone and I'd tell the teachers, I'd say, look, Stephen's bugging me. And they say, oh, he's just playing. Or they'd say, oh, sticks and, and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And it wasn't about the names, I just wanted him to leave me alone, just get out of my space. So there I was in front of the window and Stephen's there. And there are other people there. And he says, Jungle Bunny, I'm talking to you. And he's poking me. And I'm thinking, OK, I don't want to know anything. I don't want to see anything. I don't want to hear anything. And I, I, I get stuck, because I don't know what to do. It's, it's, you, when you're young, you don't really know. When you're in an uncomfortable situation, you don't always know what to do. 
I wanted to go, but I didn't want to go, because I felt if I was left, then he wins. And he's just poking me, and I didn't want to look at him and give him attention. I tried to concentrate on the Meccano in the building, in, in the shop, but I couldn't really concentrate. And he's poking, and he's poking. And it's as if my whole body starts making this noise. I feel my body making a noise. And it gets so weird, it's like I can see everything. I'm s staring in this direction, but I see everything here. I see a mother playing with a baby, another mother looking in the window, three girls, two girls talking to each other, one of them looking at me. Somewhere over there, there's a lady, and I think she had rolled up sleeves. Then here you've got these two kids, and they, they were looking in the window, but now they're looking at me, and these two dads are looking. Then you've got Steve, and he's poking, and he's poking. I said, leave me alone. And he won't leave me alone, and he comes behind my ear, and he starts going, ooh, 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 ooh. and my body boils, and then suddenly it's just, bam! I hit him, I attacked him. And I didn't, I'm a kid, but I didn't attack him to sort of win a fight. I attacked him because I think I wanted to kill him. I wanted to hurt him, I wanted all of him to break. And bam, and bam, and I'm hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting. And suddenly somebody shouts, stop it, stop it. And this arm, this big arm grabs me, and I can't hit him. And I'm only thinking, I want to hit him, I want to hurt him, and I can't do it. And I'm getting so mad, and this big arm is around me, and I can't do anything. And she says, shame on you, shame on you. You let this happen, you let this happen. And I realized she wasn't talking to me, she was talking to somebody else. But to me, she said, what have you done? Look at him, what have you done? And I looked at Stephen, he's crying, he's crying, bloody lips, bloody nose, his cheek is blue, but it's his eyes, his eyes are the things that get me. His eyes, he is so scared, he is so scared. It's a different kind of fear. And I did that to him. I did that to him. And it's, it's, I, I hate him in this moment. I want to get up and smash him, and half of me wants to feel really sorry for him. But I can't move because you've got this arm around me. And I'm raging inside. I'm raging inside and thinking, why didn't he leave me alone? Why didn't he leave me alone? And eventually, one of the fathers gets him up, and they take him away, and he, he's like broken. He's not broken, but he's... He's not the same person at the beginning. He's not the same person. And then this lady, she takes my head like this, and she puts it, we're kneeling, I don't know how we got that, and she puts it on her chest. So my head is on her chest. And she's breathing, and it's like this warm air is stroking my face. And her heart, I can hear, just so slow, and with every heartbeat, it's as if the rage, that anger that was inside me, that animal just burst out, it begins to calm down, and it gets softer, and it gets softer, and it gets softer, until I can breathe gently and quietly, and everything was very normal once again. That's the story.